Next on Contemplate. Righteousness is not about a checklist of rules to follow. It's not about a checklist. Righteousness is about being in the will of God. We're going to have a lot to think about as Pastor David teaches us what it really means to hunger for righteousness. Let's dive in. Here's Pastor David. When I was younger, uh, I didn't like beets or liver or squash or rice or sour cream or guacamole, if you can believe that. I know. I do now. It's all right. Or raisin and carrot salad, if you've ever had that. It's got the raisins. Okay. Amen. I know it's hard to believe that there's anything that I didn't like based on my current size, but there were some things I didn't like to eat. There just were. Um, and the nice thing about that was, because those things really bothered me, that my, um, my kind and my loving and my thoughtful parents, they just didn't care at all that, <laughs> that I didn't like. They made me eat that stuff. They made me eat that stuff. They would tell me, hey, there are some kids in the world who are starving. I'd be like, probably better than eating carrot and raisin salad, right? <laughs> Um, that's terrible. It's not better. Eh, uh, okay. Um, they didn't care about my feelings. <laughs> if mom made those foods, I was going to eat them. That's the way we rolled at our house. But here's the just wild thing. This is the thing that they would say to me as I was trying to gag down beets and as I'm dry uh, heaving, trying to get that stuff down. This is what they would say to me to try to make it better. They'd say, pretend like the beets are chocolate ice cream. That's what they would say. Pretend like the beets are chocolate ice cream. And I'd be like, well, I really shouldn't be eating too much ice cream. It's not <laughs> good for you. No, I would try it. I would try it. Mm, think about it. It did not work. I tried that on them the next time I got in trouble for getting an F in school. I said, just pretend like it's an A. <laughs> they did not buy it. Um, but neither did I about the beats, okay? I did not buy it about the beats because you can't pretend that something you do not like is something that you love. You can't pretend like that and make it work. My parents wanted me to change my affections, right? Change my desires. I could not do that by pretending. I actually do uh, eat beets now. Um, so you see what they've done to me. But <laughs> not a lot of beets, to be honest with you, but I, I can eat them. We desire all kinds of things. We're hungry for all kinds of things, and some of those things are not good. Some of those things are not good. But Jesus is going to talk straight to our heart in this verse, in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount that we're studying today. We've been in this series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a bunch of teachings of Jesus called Right Side Up. We've been learning from the words of Jesus, Christ himself, what it looks like to be a Christ follower. What does it look like? And the way of Christ is upside down to the world. But what we realize as we, as we get into it is it's the world that's upside down. It's Jesus Christ that's right side up. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew 5. Um, we're going to look at verse 6 and get started here. It says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, it's, it's interesting because it's hard for me to understand that metaphor, having never been hungry. Um, as you can see, that's not something, an emotion that I get a lot, um, hunger. But hungering and thirsting for righteousness Sounds kind of, I don't know, uh, prudish, something like that, right? But when we think about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, if we understand what it means as a Christ follower, it should resonate with us. It should resonate with us. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what he said about this verse, about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I do not know of a better test that anyone can apply to himself or herself in this whole matter of the Christian profession than a verse like this. If this verse is to you 
one of the most blessed statements of the whole scripture, you can be quite certain you are a Christian. If it is not, then you had better examine the foundations again. Sounds pretty important. Sounds pretty important. If we are not hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we're missing something basic. Something basic about being a Christ follower. But for some of us, the word righteousness sounds, I don't know, it sounds kind of like proper and, and prude and puritanical and, and the, like goody two-shoes, right? You guys remember? Goody, goody two-shoes. By the way, that comes from a story. I found this out. I looked it up. From back in the 1700s of this girl who had only one shoe, and eventually she got two shoes, and then she married a rich guy. That's goody two-shoes. It's probably the only thing you'll remember from today, but that is goody two-shoes, right? Goody, goody two-shoes. But Righteousness in this context, or any context, has nothing to do with puritanism or puritanicalness or prudishness or goody two shoesness. It has, has nothing to do with following rules so that we can look good in front of other people. That's got nothing to do with the righteousness that we're talking about here. Righteousness is not about a checklist of rules to follow, it's not about a checklist. Righteousness is about being in the will of God. It's about being in the will of God because God's will is by definition righteous. He is the righteous one. And so if we're in his will, we're righteous. And if we're not, we're not. But desiring God's will, hungering for God's will, will always be righteous because he is righteous. So righteousness is about living a godly life. So you are going to be doing good things. But it's not about the checklist, not about the rules. It's about having a heart after God. It's about having a heart after God. Religious people, see, the world looks at religious people and they, and they look at them like they're a bunch of people that are all about rules, right? They're all about rules. And, and some people are. Some people really are just all about rules. Paul, the apostle in scripture, he addresses some people who are making a lot of religious rules, they made a lot of religious rules, and, and they would require that everybody follow them. They would look down and judge anybody who didn't follow all their rules. Not, I'm not talking about Scripture. I'm talking about a bunch of man-made stuff that came after that, that they, that they would judge you if you didn't do. And this is what Paul says. This is in Colossians 2, 20 through 23. It says this, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concerns things with perish, which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Why would we, as followers of Christ, the God of the universe who set us free and saved us? Why would we want people to think that righteousness was about a bunch of things in a list that we're against? Here's all the things that we're against. Why would we want people to think that that's what righteousness is? You know, this idea, stop having fun. This is church. Now look serious and sad so people will think you're a good Christian. <laughs> Don't have any fun. Stop that. Righteousness is not about what we're against. Righteousness is about what we are for. It's about what we're for. Righteousness is about wanting to live in the fullness, in the richness of the Christ life. That's what righteousness is about. Righteousness is about wanting to be in the will of our loving and perfect God and Father. Wanting that, desiring that, living in that. That's what it's about. Listen, it is only the impurity of our hearts. It is only the impurity of our hearts that tempts us to think about morality and righteousness as nothing more than as simply just a list of don'ts instead of a, as a way to grow in the righteousness and the will of God. Righteousness is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's freedom. It's freedom, it's purity, it's holiness, it's peace with God and with people. It's awesome. It's an amazing, awesome, godly, powerful thing. It's children that ask, what are the rules? So they can know how far they can go, right? Those are the ones who ask, what's the rule, mom, dad, 
whichever one I think is going to give me the better rule. I might try a couple times. How late can I stay up? How late can I stay up? How many cookies can I have? Right? How long can I play video games? They are asking these questions so they can know the don'ts, so that they can run all the way up to the edge of those don'ts, but not get in trouble. Right? They're not, I never went to my parents and said, you know, tell me about the principles of why I should stay up late so that I can help. We can come to an understanding of, of really, you know, what it looks like to get a good night's sleep. No, it was, how late can I stay up? When can my bedtime go up? Right? Three or four years ago, my dad said I could stay up till 10. So it's... <laughs> People have this idea, I want to be good so I can go to heaven. I want to be good so I can go to heaven. Hey, do you th- where do you think you're going to go when you go, well, I think I'll go to heaven. Why do you think that? Well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I've seen the list of don'ts, and I don't do that many of them. I mean, look at that guy over there, right? That's kind of how people are. But if you think that, you have missed the gospel. You have entirely missed the gospel. You have entirely missed the difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world is merit-based, based based on your merit. What have you done? You have the list of don'ts? Check them off. You have the list of do's? Check them off. You've done those things? Okay, you're in or you're out or you're coming back as an ant and then a bam, you know, a elephant and then whatever until you get to where, whatever it is, all these ideas are earn, 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 but that's not the gospel. Praise God. That's not the gospel. The gospel says you can only go to heaven when you understand that you are not good. You can only go to heaven when you understand that only God is good and that you need him. You need his grace. You need his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection to be made righteous. You can't do it by yourself. You can't check off the list and get there. There's a a story of a man who came to Jesus asking about the rules. How can I get to heaven by the rules? We call him the rich young ruler. This is found in Matthew 19, uh, 16 through 22. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, it's a little bit longer of a passage. Let's check it out. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? I love that. It's like, not all of them, right? I mean, come on. The bacon thing, I don't like that rule. Jesus said, that's not a rule for us, by the way. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? I wonder if the disciples were like, boom, you know. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. But let's assume he did. Let's assume that it was all about this rule following to get to heaven. He said, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, righteous, holy, you want to be perfect? Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Brother in Christ uh, named Beckett Cook wrote a book recently called Change of Affection. Change of Affection. I highly recommend the book. Uh, It's about his life. He left a life of atheism and, and sexual brokenness to follow Christ Really interesting book, and he, and he discusses this passage here, and he points out a couple of things. First, he comes to him and says, good teacher, good teacher. This man was not showing that he honored Jesus Christ as God. He was not showing that. He was calling Jesus a good teacher, and Jesus is saying to him, now hang on a second. Why are you calling me good? Because you know, and I know, that only God is good. So the implication Jesus is saying is this, if I'm good, then I'm God. If I'm not God, then I'm not good. Make a choice, right? That's that's just staring you in the face by implication of this passage. He's saying, I'm either not God or I'm not good. Something's got to give here. 
But a lot of people today still come to Jesus with that mentality. Good teacher. He's a good teacher. What do you think about Jesus? Well, I think he was a good teacher. I think he was a good human teacher, but I don't think, I don't think he was God. But I think he was a good teacher. Here's, here's the problem. C.S. Lewis points out this problem. And he kind of smokes their argument on good teacher with this argument called the trilemma. This is how it goes. This is what C.S. Lewis says. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus is walking around saying, I'm God. I forgive sins. I'm going to judge the world. People are going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. What does that mean? What does he say? He's saying, I'm, I'm God. I made everything. I did all this. Now, if somebody was going around saying that, you go into the office tomorrow or work or whatever, and somebody's like, by the way, I'm God. I forgive you. You're going to be like, uh-huh. <laughs> Too many beats. Something's going on with that person, right? They crazy. But nobody thought that about Jesus. Interesting. You either call him a lunatic, a liar, or your savior. Those are your choices. So when this rich young ruler comes up and says, good teacher, he's missing it. Right out of the gate, he's making a mistake. He's so focused on the checklist on what he can do to get into heaven to earn his way to God, that he literally misses the son of God who he's talking to. Be careful about how focused you get on the do's and the don'ts. And look at how this man is trying to earn eternal life. What are the do's and don'ts, Jesus? Give me the list. Give me a list. Let me check the box. Follow the commandments. Which ones? Lay, lay them out for me. Tell me what I have to do so that I'm good. So I don't burn up in the fire or so I don't have this. Just tell me what to do so that I'm good. Give me the quid pro quo. I do this, you do that. Let's make a deal, God. Let's make a deal. But his heart was exposed. Jesus was taking his time and being patient with him, but he exposed his heart. He loved his wealth more than he loved God. His wealth was his God. You can't serve two masters. You either love the one and hate the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. You cannot serve God in sex. You cannot serve God in gossip. You cannot serve God in whatever it is. You cannot serve two masters. And it became clear, Jesus gave him the choice. Let your money be your master, or let me be your master. Guy walked away bummed out. Because money was more important to him than God. And we can get like this too. Give me the checklist. Go to church, check. Give some little bit of money to the church, maybe to some starving kids, check, right? Don't eat too many carbs. Well, I, not everything's going to get. Which ones, after all? Right? Let's make a list. Let's check it off so I can be a good person and get to heaven. For this man, his, his, his hang-up was money. It was money. For some of you, it might be money. That's your God. For some of you, it might be your sex life, your identity, your whatever, your, your thought life, your obsession with your kids, your obsession with your free time, or with your job, or your anger. What is it for you? You don't need to answer out loud. I already know. No, I don't really know. <laughs> Where do you rub up against righteousness and get pushed back? Where do you rub up against righteousness and go away sorrowful? Where is your heart not pure? 
Where, where are you saying in your life, I won't follow you, Jesus, if you ask for this thing? You can have this, you can have that, you can have this, you can have that. But if you ask for this, I got to go the other way. I got to go the other way. If he was here today, if Jesus was here, and of course the Holy Spirit is here, but if Jesus was here and you came up to him and said, Lord, I want to follow you, and he said, okay, first, what would the next sentence be? First, I want you to give up this thing. For how many of us would we walk away when that came? Or would it be so difficult? Or would it be so sorrowful? What couldn't we give up? Your possessions. Pretty rich in this country. If you've been anywhere else in the world, you know that. Your money, your view of sexuality, your sex life, your job title, your pride, your friends and your family, your comfort, your anger, your independence, your food, your alcohol, your politics, your iPhone. What do you say? Your entertainment choices. For some of you, maybe it's your grudges against people and your refusal to forgive that you have to hold on to. Those who have hurt you. It's easy to find where these things are in your life, by the way. It's not difficult. You want to you ferret them out? You want to look for them? All you have to ask yourself is, what do you avoid in Scripture? What makes you uncomfortable when you're reading Scripture? Now that's something to think about, isn't it? You want to be sure and listen to our next episode as Pastor David teaches us a lot more about this important area of righteousness. And if this lesson today has brought up some questions or you'd like some help in your own walk with Christ, call us, won't you? 360-885-9000. We'd love to help. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out part two for much more with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate.